this video, I would like to review and analyze a draft crypto bill by the Australian Senator Andrew Breck. My name is Dr. Alexey Konashevic and you are on Blockchain State. In September 2022, Senator Breck presented his legislative initiative for public discussion and set a deadline for comments by the end of October. Who didn't see my previous video of what the senator said presenting this crypto bill, welcome to that video. Find the link in the description. Also, in the description, you will find my review paper uh, to this bill that I sent to Senator Bragg. It's a bit shorter than this video. This video is the full version of my review. Now, let's take a closer look at the bill and review. Its purpose is to regulate digital asset exchanges, digital asset custody services, stable coins, and for Chinese digital yuan, establishing a special regulatory regime for it. Anyone who wants to play on the first three fields uh, would need a license, while the use of e yuan in Australia would need to be reported to the Australian authorities should the bill get adopted. The bill consists of seven parts. The first one is the introduction with definitions in section 5. Part 2 is devoted to three licenses, digital assets exchanges, digital asset custody services, and stable coins, and how to apply for it. Part 3 sets rules for digital yuan in Australia. Parts 4 to 6 set rules on the functions and powers of government bodies, their interaction in reporting to the Australian Parliament. And the last part 7 provides transitional conditions of this act. What is a digital asset? Let's dissect the definition of the digital asset as it applies to all three licenses. Digital asset means a digital representation of value or rights, including rights to property, the ownership of which is evidenced cryptographically and is held and transferred electronically by a type of distributed ledger technology or another distributed cryptographically verifiable data structure. I think the definition is mostly accurate and clear, except for the last phrase. I'll get to it in a moment. First, I want to emphasize that it excludes any third tokens. You won't be imprisoned for dealing with tokens that represent no value or right. You don't need a license if you create and operate with tokens, for example, just for testing purposes. As long as no legal rights or values are attached to it, it's just a pure piece of technology that doesn't require a license. Secondly, it distinguishes records of digital assets from any other electronic records that can also indicate rights and values. For example, a record in a Google Sheet file can also be used to store records of rights and values, such a spreadsheet would only match two of three features. First, records of ownership in the spreadsheet constitute what is generally called a ledger. And second, Google Sheets can also be shared so we can say they are distributed. Nevertheless, it's not a digital asset, as the core element of anything which is called digital is the use of cryptography. The mechanism of ownership is designed around the use of asymmetric cryptography where a public key is used to form an address to which a record of that right or value is attached. And the relevant private key is used to generate a digital signature that authorizes a transaction a transfer with such an asset. Please don't confuse digital signatures with electronic signatures, which is a broad notion of any form of electronic authorization. Even a scanned copy of a paper with a wet signature can be considered an electronic one. While the digital signature is a kind of electronic signature that uses public key cryptography. If you don't know what the digital signature is, you can watch my video, Basics of Cryptography. See the link in the description. In the end of the definition, we see another distributed cryptographically verifiable data structure. And frankly, I don't really know what that means. It's definitely not a widely used technology term. But I would suggest that the author try to solve the problem of substitution of concepts. Blockchain and distributed ledger technology 
are not formalized concepts. Based on my observations, people call blockchain or DLT whatever they want. And hence, nothing limits them to stop calling it DLT at all, but inventing a new term just to avoid overlapping with the law. So if anyone tries to cheat, they bump against the broad notion that basically can be applied to anything that has cryptography and operates with data in a distributed manner. The downside of this approach is that it gives the supervisory bodies discretionary power and this is always a risk as it works well until the authorities go off the rails. Such discretionary power provided to the regulators can be limited with a risk-based approach that I will discuss in a moment. Digital asset exchanges. Who need this license? A systematic analysis of Section 8 shows that the bill excludes individuals from this equation. Only incorporated entities can obtain this license. And correct me if I am wrong, but I understood that individuals can commit, may commit an exchange transaction, and that will not be a violation of the law. However, I would like to hear an opinion of the author of this bill and other lawyers uh, on how they understand Section A and similar norms for two other licenses. And frankly, when I read this text, I thought what a good idea to write acts using plain and simple language. Legislators adopted those laws about plain language in the US and recently in New Zealand for a reason. Bureaucratic language makes it harder to understand, even for lawyers. I wrote some laws and policies. I know that it's not an easy job. They got very complicated and entangled. The truth is that it's much harder to keep it clear and consistent. Second is the geographic criterion. A license is needed once a trade or commerce occurs between Australia and places outside Australia or within Australia and its territories. We sorted out what a digital asset is, but what is an exchange of a digital asset? According to Section 5, a digital asset exchange means a facility through which one or more of the following kinds of exchanges are regularly made. A. Exchanges of digital asset for currency, whether Australian or not. B. Exchanges of digital assets for another digital asset. C. Exchanges of currency, whether Australian or not, for digital assets. And there is one exception. The Australian license is not needed if the person holds a recognized foreign license that authorizes the person to operate the exchange. And the minister is responsible for recognizing such licenses. Those who violate the law shall get a criminal punishment, five-year imprisonment or a fine, and a civil penalty. The bill outlines licensees' obligations. A. The maintenance of a minimum amount of capital. B. The regulation of the conduct of the exchange's participants and protections for the exchange's participants in relation to their participation. C. Procedures relating to the exchange and monitoring activity facilitated by the exchange. D. The segregation and management of funds, including digital assets and any other kinds of assets of the exchange's participants. E. Cybersecurity, F. Disclosure of information to the exchange's participants, G. Record keeping and reporting, H. The obtaining, use and disclosure of information, including the disclosure of information to ASIC, APRA or another authority of the Commonwealth. As you see, uh, the bill doesn't establish a certain minimum amount of capital for licensees or other specific conditions. According to section 20, uh, the minister may, in accordance with these rules, a impose conditions or additional conditions on a license, or b vary or revoke conditions imposed on a license. ASIC, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, is the supervisory body according to this act. 
Introducing this bill, Senator Bragg wrote that there is a risk of stifling the industry and he didn't want the regulators to run the show. But reading the bill, I have an impression that things can easily go wrong with it. If I didn't want to stifle the industry, I would choose another tactic. I would design simple rules and limit the power of the bureaucrats by introducing a risk-based approach, which I will discuss a bit later, and a declarative principle to make licensing easier. It's widely known that Australia's current financial and banking regulations are very complex. There is a risk that the proposed legislation will stifle the fintech and DeFi industry, which appeared as a response to excessive bureaucracy and outdated regulations in the first place. For example, throughout the years of a regulatory regime for purchased payment facilities, PPF, in Australia, only one company managed to get this license, PayPal. At the same time, dozens of providers operate in the European Union under their similar electronic money institution license. For exchanges as well as for other licensees, it is proposed to introduce alternative tiers using a declarative principle. Under this principle, the regulator approves an application without actual expertise, only formal verification, when it contains the applicant's statement of satisfying all the requirements of this license. And if such an applicant, one, limits the exchange volume up to, say, uh, $10 million daily, and two, guarantees its liability by a, having insurance coverage provided by an Australian insurance company, or B, having a financial guarantee provided by an Australian financial or banking institution of that volume. The volume in tiers can be variable and gradable. For example, a volume guarantee 1 to 1, 10 to 10, 100 to 100 million dollars, and so on. And up to some amount after which uh, the licensee shall obtain the full license. Digital Asset Custody Services The second license is for custody services. The bill defines Digital Asset Custody Service means a service prescribed by the rules that relate to the safekeeping, servicing or management of a digital asset. And here we encounter the second vague definition which provides discretionary power to the regulator. I will analyze it in the end of this section. Let's have a look first at what conditions established this field. Here we can observe similar norms for exchanges. It applies to incorporated legal entities that provide services in Australia. The license is not needed if you have a recognized license abroad. But if you violate the law, civil and criminal penalties can be applied, including five-year imprisonment. Among digital asset custody requirements are a. The designation of key personnel in Australia to be responsible for the provision digital asset custody services by the licensee. b. The maintenance of a minimum amount of capital. c. Proper auditing, assurance and disclosure arrangements. The current Australian Financial Services AFS license, which includes custody services, generally covers the field of the asset custody. Therefore, it's unclear why it would be better than the existing AFS, considering that one, the regulator will be the same ASIC. Two, this legislation establishes high-level norms, leaving discretionary power to the regulator to elaborate on requirements. The legislator can address the problem by providing alternative license tiers that I already discussed and by enjoining the regulator to develop uh, risk-based requirements, which I will discuss later. There is also a concerning aspect of providing such a broad definition of uh, custody services, such as safekeeping services or management of a digital asset. The regulator may interpret that escrow services require the license and having no risk-based tiers 
will mandate the same requirements as other custodians. Escrow can provide arbitration dispute resolution services under multi-signature schemes that technically restrict their sole control over the asset. I wonder what the policy would be towards escrow and arbitrators using multi-signature schemes. Such a service doesn't constitute an equivalent risk to those fully controlling private keys in custodial wallets. And yet again, we need to articulate here the need of the risk-based approach. Stablecoin Stablecoin means a digital asset which is designed to maintain a stable value relative to a particular unit of account or store of value. If you want to issue a stablecoin in any currency, not only in Australian dollars and operated in Australia, you will need this license. You must be an incorporated entity in Australia. Alternatively, you need to hold a recognized license abroad. As you see, it's pretty much similar to two other licenses. Violating these rules will lead to a civil penalty and criminal charges, including five-year imprisonment term. Section 17 establishes stablecoin issue requirement, and probably the most important one is A, the requirement that the full amount of the face value of the liabilities for the stablecoins on issue from the licensee must be held in reserve by the licensee in accounts kept with an ADI, an Australian Deposit Taking Institution in Australia, in either one uh, Australian currency or two if the stable coins are designed to be stable relative to foreign currency, that foreign currency. This is a hit below the belt to all popular stable coins because they keep their reserve in questionable values. If stock prices go down, such stable coins can get into trouble, so they can hold their assets in securities with no value and liquidity. You can watch my video, Do You Have the Right to Redeem Your Stable Coin, where I studied the legal terms and conditions of the two largest stable coins. Tethers USDT and Circles USDC. They do not legally promise to exchange these stablecoins back for currency. So, bravo, Senator Bragg, good call to finally mandate one to one reserve. I have only one suggestion set an unconditional obligation for a stablecoin issuer to redeem currency upon the first request of a coin holder. So stable issuers don't even think about cheating in their legal terms. That article on Cointelegraph revealed that major stablecoin players established waivers in their legal terms that relieve them from exchanging their stablecoins back for money, which is not acceptable. It is proposed that the legislation recognizes such waiver void and mandates redemption upon the first coin holder's request. Interestingly, such stablecoins overlap with the concept of electronic money. For example, in the European Union, you can get an electronic money license under the same condition one-to-one -one, and taking into account that regulations are designed based on the principle of technological neutrality, it doesn't matter if the issuer uses a centralized database to keep records uh, or conducts transaction on a blockchain. More so, Australia has its e-money legislation. It is called Purchase Payment Facilities. According to APRA's guidelines, PPF providers form a special class of authorized deposit-taking institution that are authorized to undertake a limited range of banking activities. However, only one company has got such a license, PayPal. It's way too complicated and bureaucratic. My systematic analysis of PPF regulation shows that the issuer can also use DLT, distributed ledger technology or blockchain, so formally stablecoins can be issued under PPF regulation. And because in this act the legislator gives broad discretionary power to the regulator, Australia might end up with two regulatory regimes, purchase payment facilities and stablecoins, 
that A are basically the same and B discourage from doing business in Australia. Risk-based approach. It is proposed that the legislation urges the regulators to develop licensing requirements based on clearly identified risks which may evolve over time. A licensee developing its business model willingly chooses risk levels and therefore the regulator can establish different requirements depending on the licensee's business model and chosen technology. There are two types of risks involved here. One, risks related to control over the asset or the mechanism of ownership. And two, the risk of the chosen ledger technology. For example, a custodial wallet through which a service operator controls users' private keys will constitute the same risk as a non-custodial wallet, the user exclusively in this case, controls the key, but operated on a private ledger solely controlled by such an operator. Using the word blockchain may mislead the average user as the operators arbitrarily use this word towards all sorts of technologies, creating an impression that such technology ensures a certain class of security. There are three degrees of control over the assets through the mechanism of ownership, normally ensured through public key cryptography. Full non-exclusive when a service provider technically gets the ability to commit any transaction with the asset. Exclusive is when the service provider has full control over the asset. The user doesn't have direct independent access to the asset and such access is mediated through such a provider and limited when the provider cannot solely commit the transaction but needs a user or another independent party. Some multi-signature schemes provide limited access. Full and exclusive constitute the highest risk towards an asset as the custodian can misappropriate funds and commit an unauthorized transaction. Therefore, I would separate custodial services with full and exclusive access and such services as escrow and arbitration in which the provider is technically limited to solely commit a transaction. For example, Alice sends the product to Bob. Bob sends the cryptocurrency to a two of three multi-signature address as the payment. The address is controlled by Alice, Bob and an independent escrow, Chuck. If Bob gets the product, Alice and Bob will sign the transaction and release the funds to Alice. But if they have a dispute, Chuck will sign a transaction with either side. Also, this scheme can have Judy as an arbitrator, and Chuck in this scheme will play only a technical role of the key keeper but will follow the legal instruction of Judy. By the way, in May 2022, as a response to the uh, Treasury's uh, paper, I sent a full analysis of risks explaining details of this approach. It is a 14-page expert-level paper. Please find the link in the description if you're interested. Chinese Yuan. The Act mandates Chinese banks to report to the Australian authorities if they want to operate their digital yuan in Australia. Digital yuan is a kind of central bank digital currency or CBDC. The EU yuan provider must a. Provide the number of Australian businesses that have accepted payments using digital yuan that are facilitated by the designated bank. B. The number of digital wallets for Australian customers of the designated bank that are open. C. The total amount of digital yuan held in digital wallets by Australian customers of the designated bank. Two supervisory authorities, APRA and the Reserve Bank of Australia, will report annually to the Minister and the Parliament. I bet many people think, wait, why only electronic yuan. Even though it's the first operating CBDC in the world, why wouldn't the legislator establish such rules for any CBDC operating in Australia? 
let's be honest, China is different. It's the largest authoritarian regime that constitutes a permanent threat to the free world, as they do not respect fundamental human rights and the principles of the free market. The first positive aspect this act demonstrates that the Australian government recognizes this threat. Secondly, the act says we don't prohibit the digital yuan. We are not an authoritarian regime. We are not them. But if they want to operate in our free market, they must comply with our standards. Hence, we are watching you. Don't even think about whatever you think. When does this act enter into force? Should the act get adopted, it commences in six months. But according to part seven, once it commences, it establishes a three month transitional period. So those who operate on the Australian market will have six plus three months period to apply for a license. That's it. Stay tuned as I will keep informing on blockchain state how this legislative initiative develops. Hit like and don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next video.